Philippians chapter 4. We've been in a series on winning the war in your mind. And today I want to talk about calming our anxious mind. How many of you have ever experienced anxiety before? All right. How about fear? Worry? Okay. There's lots more, right? I like to start with something funny. I actually heard this funny story about this uh, family. Oh, actually, Gary, the Rangers Outpost 80 will be at the table. Is that right? Out there? And what are they doing at the table afterwards? Signing up? So if you want to sign up, your kids, even if you want more information about Wednesday night, um, stop out and, uh, and sign up, and uh, it'll be a blessing to you for sure. But I, I read this story <clears throat> about this hillbilly family, and they were really like hillbillies. They never left their home. In fact, they never listened to uh, television, which is okay by me. They never listened to the radio. But they one day decided to take a trip to the big city. And uh, they went to a shopping mall. And never seen anything like it before in their lives. And the thing that fascinated them the most were these silver doors that kept opening and closing. And they saw this one lady get in there. You know, she's about 90-some years old. She'd come walking over with a, a walker, you know. And like, you know, the walkers, with, you ever seen them with the uh, tennis ball on the end of them? And she was like taking her good old time, you know. She, and they were just Phil Billy family. They'd never seen it. So they just watched the, the doors open up, those silver doors. And she went in there, closed. And just a few seconds later, the doors open and out stepped this 24-year-old girl with blonde hair, blue eyes. And they were amazed. And the young child said to his father, he said, Dad, what in the world kind of invention is that? He said, I don't know, son, but quick, go get your mother. <laughs> All right. Praise God. You know, <laughs> what's that have to do with this sermon? Nothing. Absolutely, positively Nothing. I just wanted to see your pearly whites. You still got them, okay? Praise God. Um, you know, we've been in this study on winning the war in your mind, and today I want to talk about calming your anxious mind. And there's so many scriptures to back up what we've been teaching on. How many understand most battles are won and lost right here in the mind? Amen. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, people get worried. And if you're like me, there's times, if I'm not careful, that my thoughts can be like a runaway freight train. You ever been there? Yeah. And they start out at one thing, and it just starts going and going and going. And, you know, we've talked about, the premise of this series has been that your life is always moving, listen, in the direction of your most dominant thought. Your life is always moving in the direction of your most powerful or your strongest thought. How many of you believe that? There's been many, many books written on this. Uh, Dr. Joyce Meyer, of course, way back in the 80s, with the classic, The Battlefield of the Mind. How many remember that one? She's got great devotionals to go with that and so many other great ones. But, you know, people get worried, and this is how it starts. They'll start to worry, and they'll say, I don't want to get a bad grade, because if I get a bad grade, I might not go to the right college. And if I don't go to the right college... I might not get the job that I want to get, and if I don't get the job I, uh, that I want to get, I might marry somebody that I don't really want to marry. If I marry somebody I don't want to marry, we might have the wrong kind of kids. <laughs> they might have crooked teeth, and they might need braces, and I can't afford braces, and I can't send them to college because I'm still paying for my own college. And my, the kids will resort to a life of crime, and they'll wind up in prison, and thinking about all this is giving me a headache. And by the way, now that I got a headache, I think I might have a brain tumor. <laughs> and you say, you're really exaggerating. Well, not really. Because if, if we were to take a survey here today of how your thought life is, and we put it up on that screen in the last 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours or the last week or the last month or the last year, how many know that our thoughts aren't always pleasing to God? In fact, our thoughts can be like a one runaway freight train. And listen, everything starts in the mind. And so we look at Paul now in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. And he's in jail. He's in prison. He's not in a country club. 
Uh, he's not a multimillionaire. He uh, doesn't have girls like fanning him with big feathers because it's hot and feeding him grapes and he's getting manicures and pedicures and people waiting on his every beck and call. This is Paul. He's a prisoner for Christ. In fact, he's in a dark, dank Roman prison chained to a different guard awaiting ex execution. Every eight hours, he's got a new guard that he's chained to. And this is what he says. Verse 6 of chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And here's the promise. And the peace of God. Everybody say the peace of God. Which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. And then in verse 9, and here's the promise again, and the God of all peace will be with you. I want to talk to you today about calming my anxious mind. But before I do that, just turn to the person next to you and say, peace be to you. Now, that's too formal for you. Just go ahead and say, get you some peace. In fact, why don't you type that in the chat, get you some peace, okay? Let's pray. God, thank you for the privilege, really, that it is to be found here in your house, oh, Lord. That every day, Lord, including this day, is a gift from you, Lord. And what we do with it, how we frame it, Lord God, what we make of it, that's up to us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to think with the right mind, Lord. Help us to think with the mind of Christ, Lord. For those that are anxious today, Lord God, for those that are experiencing anxiety or depression or worry or fear, God, any of those negative thoughts or negative thought processes, Lord God. Father, I pray that by the power of the word, and the illumination of the Holy Spirit, that we would take every thought captive into captivity and make it bow to the obedience of Christ. We ask it now in Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said. Amen. Amen. So let's talk about it for a minute. Worry, anxiety, those kind of things, you know. Everybody is given the opportunity to go there. And depending on circumstances, and sometimes things cause us to go there. And so, you know, I just want to say this to you. Whatever you think on is what you're going to get. How many know if you, it's good? If you think good thoughts, you're going to feel better. If you think bad thoughts, you're going to feel worse. And honestly, i just give a little personal example here. The other day, I was just feeling like, I don't know. I, don't, I am too busy to sit around and think about my feelings. I don't know about you. I got just stuff to do, you know. And many times I'll say uh, to my wife, I'm like, come on, I got, I got crap to do. Anybody else talk like that besides me? <laughs> come on, any men in the house? I got stuff to do, whatever you want to call it. I got stuff to do. I'm busy. I'm a busy person. I'm going to sit around contemplating about how my feelings all the time. What in the world, you know? But yet, I started feeling this funny feeling. I can't explain it. I was just like not all into the day. And I was trying to understand why I felt that way. I felt like this, I can't explain it to you, it was like this, this blah type feeling. Hey, does this make sense to anybody? Because it's very rare for me, but I just had this come over me and I was like, my God, I got, I got stuff to do. Why in the world am I feeling this kind of like something? I don't know, maybe because the air condition quit working in our house and it's like 92 degrees on the thermostat inside the house. Maybe because the guy I called three times to show up to fix our air conditioner who told me he was coming didn't show up. I'm not really sure what it was, but I can't blame my thoughts on anybody else. I've got to take full responsibility. And full disclosure, I don't always do a good job at that. I'm sure you guys are way more spiritual than I am. Especially those of you who are sleeping now during the preaching of the Word of God. Jesus said, sleep on now. But I'll just come and shake you on the shoulder. Because I'm not Jesus. I just represent him, amen? But listen to this. Now, this is interesting. Now, we're going to go a little medical, okay? We're going to go a little psychological. But I want to show you how many know science actually supports the Word of God. 
in fact, what they're just learning these days has been true since the dawn of creation. And we have it in the Bible in our laps. But just to show you how it's just called the study of there's neuroscience and neurotheology. It's the study of the mind and how the Word of God, again, in science coincides. So, so the first thing I want to tell you, there's a part in our brain that's called the amygdala. How many have ever heard of this? There's a picture of it. It's about the shape and size of an almond. It's in your brain. And the amygdala actually is, is what ca- causes you to have fight or flight mode. How many know what fight or flight is? Like the other day, I was driving on my motorcycle, and somebody was not paying attention in the oncoming traffic. I think they might have been texting on their phone, and they swerved into my lane. How many know my amygdala kicked in, and like a stampede of horses rushed lots of adrenaline through my brain? And I had to quick respond and swerve out of the way so, you know, you weren't at a funeral today instead of church. So it's the amygdala, and it's not wrong, it's actually healthy, because just like Jessica and Stan responded quickly with the amygdala because the adrenaline, you see how that works? It's a real part of the human brain. The adrenaline kicks in. That's why a mom, especially a baby, you've heard, you know this, could be under a car, they could lift a car up and rescue their baby. Like, how did they get that superhuman strength? It wasn't their own, it was the adrenaline that kicked in from that part of their brain. So it's good, it's, it's the amygdala is, makes you wired for survival. It's the fight or flight. So, you know, danger kicks in. And, you know, we all have different areas that we, that we get anxiety and stress like that, right? For my wife, she's a very strong person, but she doesn't like poisonous snakes. In fact, she doesn't like any kind of snakes. Anybody like that here? All right, see, that's why her, her Wednesday night group is so large, birds of a feather. But like when my kids were little, we lived in the country, like they would bring my son Kyle especially, he loves snakes. He's a, we could say he's a snake handler. Even though this is not the snake handler church, and even though we were in West Virginia a few weeks ago, we didn't go to that church. We went to a different one. But Kyle would bring a snake in to the kitchen. And my wife, who's this strong inner person, strongest person I know, I mean, she's seen a lot of stuff, folks. Trauma nurse, I mean, you name it. She hates snakes. Does anybody hate snakes? Look at all the hands. And so they found a way early on, the kids, you take a snake, and if you transfer it from your hands, it actually goes limp. And so they would, she'd bring, you know, bring, they bring the... Imagine your five-year-old with a dirty face coming in with a snake. You're washing the dishes, and all of a sudden, hey, mom, look what I found. She's like, get that out of here. You know what that is? That's the amygdala kicking in to say, danger, danger, Will Robinson, okay? Okay. And so that it's, it's not bad, but here's the problem with it. The amygdala is not objective at all. Are you hearing me? So it's hardwired to protect. There's triggers that set it off, like the snake or whatever it might be for you. Different ones for different people. Uh, you know, make your heart jump. But the amygdala, the amygdala cannot survive on its own. Watch this. Here's the other part of the brain that it actually needs, it gets help for. That's called, the next picture is the prefrontal cortex. That's the front lobe of your brain that actually is the voice of reason. And the voice of logic. Aren't you thankful that we have reasonable people and logical people? All right. And so, I'm trying to give you an example. That's the logic part of it. So, in other words, at night, if you've ever had, like, there was this one man, and his wife always thought a burglar was going to be in the house. And so, every single night before they would go to sleep, they lived in this big old two-story farmhouse, she'd say, honey, go downstairs and check all the doors. Make sure they're locked. And he'd say, I, I already did, but you know, as a good married man for many years, he'd go down and double check for her, and he would come back and, is the, is the coast clear? Yeah, there's no burglar in the house. You can sleep easy now. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And so for 30 full years, this man would check. She'd say, go down and make sure. I got it, I got it. Got to the point she didn't even have to tell him. But actually what would happen is he would just go ahead and sit on the bottom of the steps like a good husband. With his phone, of course. And he'd wait a couple minutes. Then he'd come back up and say, the coast is clear, honey. There's no burglar in the house tonight. 
Until one night. One night, she said, I think I heard something. And he said, okay, I'll check for you. He went down the kitchen, sure enough, round the turn. There's a burglar right in his, in their kitchen. And you know what he said to him? He said, listen, I'll give you what you want, but can I ask one favor of you? And the burglar was like, ask a favor of me? I'm in your house. He said, yes, my wife has been expecting you for 30 years. Would you introduce yourself to her? <laughs> Some of you will get that later today. It's okay. It's all right. I laugh at my own jokes even if no one else does. And they don't even have to make sense. But the, prob- the challenge is that the prefrontal cortex, listen, balances out the amygdala. So, like, in other words... If, 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 say, husband and wife are in bed, and she's like, I heard something. There's somebody in the house. And she said like three times, I heard something. Don't you hear that noise down there? And then the voice of logic, the prefrontal cortex will say, will clear his throat and say, <clears throat> it's just the cat. Relax. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So God gave us both of those things, and they actually, they're both needed. And what we have to be careful that one doesn't get out of balance So these triggers, right? So here's what Paul said. Listen to this. I'm going to read this to you again. Do not be anxious about... Do not be anxious about anything, but in every single situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Present your request to God. You see what he's saying? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your what we're talking about today, in Christ Jesus. So people get, they get anxious, you know, big test coming up, big job interview coming up, maybe you've got a test, you got to go to the doctors. My good friend Jimmy Brzezetti had to go into the doctor and this week after, you know, and I won't get into all the details medically, but it was a very trying time for him. And he said, the first thing I said to the surgeon when he came in, he said, am I in trouble? And he said, no, you're not in trouble. We're going to take care of this thing. And so, by the way, we're not anti-doctor here, you know. Luke was a medical doctor. We just believe that God gives them the ability, amen, to do what they do. And so, you know, people have financial fears. They'll say, I'm never going to have enough money, no matter what I do. I always am running hand to mouth here. I, I'm living check to check. I'm getting tired. I'm not, or they'll say, I'll always be overweight. I'll never be able to get a handle on my weight. It's so frustrating. And they get into this mode because they're thinking about things that they shouldn't be thinking about. And then they're actually declaring things that they shouldn't be declaring. Are you hearing? Is anybody home today? And here's the thing about prayer that just killed me. People will say, all we can do now is pray. Amen. Did you ever hear people say that? All we can do now is pray. Amen. Let me tell you something, friend. It's like, can you imagine how God in heaven feels when you say, we just, all we can do now is pray. <laughs> can you imagine, Brother Jeff, God in, is in heaven. He's like this. You think I could help? I might be able to help you. I actually parted the Red Sea. I actually caused the the head of an axe to swim. Need I go further? I actually spoke the earth into existence. I actually flung all the stars into place. I think I can handle your bank account. Amen? Praise God. And it's real. I mean, we all deal with this stuff, folks. If we're honest today, you know, we had two of our bank accounts were hacked in the last two weeks. Yeah. And it's not fun. My amygdala kicked in full gear. (laughs) Especially when I saw somebody in Chicago, Illinois, ordered $107 worth of pizza from Pizza Hut. (laughs) And you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to go eat pizza after that. But that's not the right response. Okay? So think about this. So, you know, prayer is actually not the last line of defense. It should be the first line of offense. Can you say amen? Amen. That's why the Hebrew writer said, let us go boldly before the throne of grace with our prayers. Everybody go like this. Come on. Our prayers and our petitions. Let them be made known unto God. And so, now listen, this is really interesting. Now, this I, bless me this week. Not only does prayer move the heart of God, prayer actually, listen to this, changes the chemistry in your brain. 
absolutely, positively, medically, scientifically, that's all backed up. And so, you know, for, dec- so for decades, uh, they believed that the brain stopped develop- de- developing after, like, adolescence. I'm glad my brain didn't stop after adolescence. Okay? I'll be hanging out with three-year-olds, okay? Actually, I do hang out with three-year-olds. They're called my grandchildren. I had three of them on my back the other night doing push-ups. And one of them fell, hit their head, and then my wife had uh, her amygdala kicked in or whatever. And she was mad at me. I said, ah, that'll be fine. Rub a little dirt on it. Those of you that are like 30 and under are like, what does that mean, rub a little dirt on it? I don't have an app for that. Anyway, anyway. So neuroplasticity is the word that means, listen, that your mind can actually learn new things. It can actually think new thoughts. And the longer you think a thought, whether good or bad, the actually the easier it is to think. Amen. So whether they're thoughts about God and his word or whether they're thoughts about that you have some kind of a hang-up, whatever that might be. Are you still with me? So studies between the brain and the belief in prayer changes your brain. And I want to read you a quote. This is a great book. This is Dr. Carolyn Leaf. She wrote this book. Listen to this born-again believer. She wrote this many years ago. It's called Switching on Your Brain. How many know sometimes you got to put your thinking cap on a little bit? Okay? Don't let the television think for you. Because that actually has the adverse effect on your brain. And this is her quote. I quote her now. It has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer, what we're talking about now, over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. Think about that. Twelve minutes a day of focused prayer for eight weeks can actually be picked up now. Studies have proven this again and again medically on a brain scan. So you go into a hospital, you get a brain scan? What do they call that? Is that a CT scan? What is it? Okay. Cat scan. We don't like cats here. Sorry, I have a funny joke. I won't say it. I'll save it later. (laughs) Anyway. Uh, So it's interesting, right? So just this toxic thing, negative thoughts hurt the brain. Prayer heals, prayer transforms, and prayer renews our mind. What did Paul say? Do not be conformed to the patterns or the thinking of this world, but be what? Come on, somebody. Transformed. By what? The renewing of our mind. So the mind must be renewed. Say that with me. The mind must be renewed. The mind must be renewed. Watch this. Daily. It's not a one-time experience because no matter how saved you are, your soul is saved, but your mind must be renewed each and every day through the washing of the Word of God, through prayer, what we're talking about now, okay? Okay. So listen what he says. He says, take every thought captive. Watch this. Uh, Romans 8, 5. Now, what, what, so what is worry? Let me just establish that. Worry is actually distrusting in the promises of God. Let me say that again. Worry is actually distrusting in the promises of God. Are you with me? So it's a sin. It's actually a sin To worry. The Bible says anything is not a faith is sin. So it's like saying, God, I don't trust you, and I'm I'm a better manager than you are with my health, with my finances, with whatever, my relationships. And so we take God out of the equation, and we try to do it ourselves. Let me ask you a question. How's that working for you? (laughs) That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Romans 8, 5. Listen to Paul now, ready? So again, we're going to let the logical part of my brain choose what is spiritual instead of the sinful nature decide what it wants to do, okay? Romans 8, 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. You know anybody like that? But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit here on Pentecost Sunday, those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature, he writes, Paul, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So what I've got to do, I've got to take every thought captive 
every thought captive, the thing that causes you worry, the thing that causes you anxiety, the thing that you've been asking somebody to pray for you for 47 years now, and you have the ability yourself to talk to God and to think with the right mind. We have the mind of Christ. The problem is we don't, we don't utilize it, folks. Amen? So what does that mean to take every thought captive? That's taking the prefrontal cortex, watch this, and it's grabbing the amygdala by the tail and making it bow to the obedience of God. Amen. It's called your thought life. Come on. You need to think about what you're thinking about. Marilyn Hickey, great healing evangelist of yesteryear, Brother Ted told us this story. He said that one time they were at a big crusade with thousands of people. R.W. Schambach was there. And Marilyn Hickey, they, they saw her praying, and they noticed that on the bottom of her high heels, she had these words written. And so they asked her, they said, what is that? Later on when she got done praying, she said, she lifted up, she said, one says the, the other one is the devil. The devil. Where's the devil at? He's under my feet. Can you say praise God? That's where those thoughts of negativity, worry, fear, anxiety, depression also belong. Can you say Amen. Why? Because we have a transformed mind by the power of God. If you don't know God, we'll settle that today. Amen? Amen. And so let me make this really practical for you. I'm going I'm to show you something. This is, a, this is a little, what I like to call a, a prayer box. Okay? So let's, go, let's try this. So here's what we do. We take our worries, right? We... we, we we take, our, we, take our, sorry, we take our worries and we give them to God. Right? We take our worries and we give them to God. And then we say, okay, God, I'm dealing with this situation. I've got this test to take. I've got this job interview. Uh, I've got a stressful person I'm married to. Uh, I've got financial strain. And Lord, I, I, I know what your word says, that, that I can take my worries and I can lay them at your feet. I can cast my cares upon you and you'll give me rest for my soul. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, a lot of scriptures to back this up. But as I'm summarizing this, folks, what happens is once we do that, we take our worry and we give it over to God and then how many know after we do that through prayer, then we wait. Like five minutes. And then if we're honest, what we actually do is we take our worry back from God and we start to carry it around. Amen? How many know we do this if we're, if we're honest today? Worry. And here's what the problem is. The problem is real simple. Watch this. The problem is real simple. Our worries are too big and our God is too small. What it actually should be is the opposite. Can you say praise God? And so... You say, do you have worries at, at, the, at the risk of being very transparent and vulnerable with you? Of course I do. I have things that I deal with, stressors, triggers. I have thoughts in my life that sometimes aren't pleasing to God, and they cause my life to move in the direction that I'm thinking about. And so, like, I'll give you an example. I really, really, really love my wife of over 32 years. And, uh, but sometimes, respectfully, she's late. <laughs> and so while I'm waiting, and waiting, I heard one guy that was married a long time, he said, I spent half my life waiting for that woman. <laughs> while I'm waiting, I'll... I get nervous, and I'll send a text message, and it'll be loving and kind. It'll be like this, where are you? <laughs> and if I don't get an immediate response, I'm just being honest with you. I'll start, my mind will start to go in all kinds of directions, and I'll think things like, my God, I hope something didn't happen on the way to the church. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We used to ride together when our kids were little, like a happy family on Sundays, until the kids hit about five, three, and one. And then, they, and then I had to start riding by myself. Because <laughs> those kids, I told the kids, they're going to wreck my anointing. 
But, you know, if you're honest, I, I'm just being transparent. Is this okay today? I'm trying to help you. It's just because I have some of my own struggles, too, if we're, if we're honest, you know. Listen, you, can't, you can fool everybody. You won't never fool God. He knows you better than you know yourself, sir. But I, I'll think about those things, you know. And, and I'll think, oh, my God, I hope something didn't happen. And if something happens to her and she's in an accident or, God forbid, gets bodily injured or death, I wouldn't want to go on any longer. And I certainly wouldn't want to lead this church. And so it's a thought. Is this okay today? So what do you do? You, 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 you take those worries and you give them over to God. As my, my kids, how many of you had kids and they, when they got their first driver's license, they got the car keys by themselves for the first time? Anybody remember those days? Oh, Jesus. Now they get to worry about their own kids, amen? But it caused you to worry. And, I, and, and you have to release that and let them go. And this is what I'd say, God, I know, I, you know I love my kids, but I know you love them a whole lot more than I do. And so watch this. I'm giving this worry over to you, and you're going to take care of them. Can you say praise God? Amen. Amen. And so for some of us this morning, it's not only a matter of giving our worries to God, but watch this. We actually need to give our life to God. We need to give our life to God. Because see, I want to challenge you to do something right now. This week, make one of these, what we call a God box. Would you do that? It doesn't have to be as cool looking as this one. <laughs> but take a shoe box, I don't know, whatever you got, okay? Would you, how many of you do this? Is that, I want, this will really help you, trust me. I know what I'm saying here. This will really, really help practically now. Are you ready? So take this God box... And every time you go to worry about something that's continuing to, like how the enemy, because how many know the enemy knows? He tries to attack our mind like we're talking about. Write it down. Watch this. Write it down and put it in the God box. Okay? And when you do that, when you, if, if you start to worry again, watch this. Sandy, this would be great at the mountain. <laughs> You're feeling this, aren't you? High five. See? Have them do it. Get a box. Simple. Little God box. Watch this. Write down the thing that's giving you stress, each one of you. Put it in the box. Watch this. And then when you start to worry about it again, physically, I'm telling you, pick it up out of the box and say, God, I'm taking this worry back on me. You say, I, I never do that, but actually you do, if you're honest. It's called the battle of the mind. Are you still with me today? Let me tell you something. The devil himself would love for you to miss this whole piece. Because he doesn't want you getting free. He wants you to be tormented by your own thought life. And for some of us, we actually not only need to give our worries to God, watch this, but we need to give our life to God. Because we are seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Therefore, we are in God already. Can you say praise God? Give God some praise. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. So what am I going to do? You know, listen, a couple things. I'll give you these very quickly, and then we're done. Number one, when you're faced with these things, do what you can first. Okay? I have a test this week. I'm not going to pray and not study, because that's irresponsible. Actually, how many know the, there's two parts every miracle? And there's a big part of it is your part and my part. <laughs> Amen? So I got to test, Brother John, I got to study. And, you know, I'm not, I've got to, listen, you've got to take care of yourself. You've got to eat right. You've got to find a, a, craft a budget of some sort. And then God has something to bless. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? You can't just put everything on God and say, God, 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 you got to do this. God, 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 you got to take care of me. God, 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 this is all on you. No, 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 no. You've got to start with what you can do first. The man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror. You've got to take responsibility. Trust me, I know, folks, this very well. Man, I mean, I've been faced with stuff like you wouldn't even believe, friend. You know, I've had, I've had concerns. I've had worries at times. My own wife, my kids. You know, I've, you know when I face worry, really heavy, hot and heavy here a little over a year ago when we refused to lock the doors on this house. And I went to prayer. Because the Bible says, with prayer and petition, make your request be made known to God. 
And, and I mean, it was fierce, man. And everybody and their cousin was shutting everything down. And it's like, what are you going to do, pastor? I said, I'm going to pray and talk to God and see what he wants me to do. Amen. Most of the time, it's never going to be the popular opinion of man. You know? And I remember the Lord said to me, I was praying in the, right here. And he said, don't you dare lock those doors, son. I'm right here with you. And I'll tell you, it comes at a price, man. A price. But we give those things to God. Through prayer, we give them to God. Can you say amen? amen. So much that we have at our disposal. I've got to do what I can do. Okay. Now here's the second one out of three. You've got to give God what you can't do. Amen? Amen. Sounds simple, but simple doesn't mean it's easy. Because I'm giving it over to God. I'm giving this over to Him. Right? When I was a kid, we used to sing this song. Leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord. And leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Amen? Amen. That's what you've got to do. You've got to give it over to God. Do what you can do on your own, and whatever you can't do, you give to God. Amen? Praise God. And then lastly, trust God no matter what. Amen. <laughs> trust Him. I said, okay, Lord, I didn't lock the door. I had to remind God of that. Because he's forgetful. I mean, I'm forgetful of his promises. How many of you have a good forgetter? Oh, yeah. God's faithful. Listen. He said, I am God, I change not. Jesus Christ said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if God is with you, guess what? It's a majority. It don't matter who might be against you. Listen. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. And when your faith is tested, and it will be tested at times, square your shoulders. As a man of God, if there's other preachers watching, stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. Keep a renewed mind. Don't take things people say so personal and so serious all the time. Talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. Can you say amen? Praise God. I'm almost done here. So it's possible and it's a choice. Listen, can you imagine this? Imagine having complete peace in your life. Heart peace. Joy. Peace in your mind. Comes through trusting in the Lord. Amen? amen. Praise God. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto I'm on understanding, but acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he will direct our path, right? Amen. Amen. So let me just, I'm just going to give you a couple of these and we're done. If I don't control, if you don't control what you think, you'll never control what you do. Think about that just a minute. If you don't control what you're thinking about, you're never going to be able to control what you're doing. Everybody got it? So... What do I, I'm going to do? I'm going to write it, think it, confess it until I believe it. Amen. No matter what I feel, it matters what's real. So I'm going to write it, I'm going to think it, I'm going to confess it, and I'm going to believe it. Amen. Amen? Think it, write it, confess it, believe it. Think it, write it, confess it, believe it. This is for you now. Say it out loud with me. Think it, write it, confess it, believe it. Say it again. Think it, write it, confess it, and believe it. That's what you got to do. And what, watch this. Then the new path in your mind will start to be walked through. And I told you this. If you, look, if you're, if you're, the way you react to stress is you go for the refrigerator and you eat the gallon of ice cream and then you feel worse because you ate a gallon of ice cream to drown your sorrows, instead of doing that, Regina's a great health coach sitting in the back today, 
you take a different path, you bypass the refrigerator, and you walk out the front door, and you go for a little walk, and you start to get your strength back. Can you say amen? amen. And you realize that you avoided doing the wrong thing, okay? Nothing wrong with ice cream, as long as you don't need a half gallon every night. That's so much I want to say. I just won't say it. Lord, help me. Jesus, help me. Okay. So here's, here's, listen, here's something that I have about my own life. Are you ready? You think it, you write it, confess it, believe it. Let me say it to you. Jesus is first in my life. Okay. You say, give me an example. I'm giving you one. I exist to serve and to glorify him and him only. I am disciplined. Christ is, Christ in me is stronger than the wrong desires in me. I am growing closer to Christ every day because of God. My family is closer than ever before. My body is stronger than ever before. My faith is deeper. My leadership is sharper than it has ever been before. I am creative, innovative, driven, focused, and blessed beyond measure because the Holy Spirit dwells in me. What am I going to do? I'm going to think it. I'm going to write it. I'm going to confess it, and I'm going to believe it. I'm going to think it. I'm going to write it. I'm going to confess it, and I'm going to believe it. You've got to declare what's true about it. Think it, write it, confess it, believe it. Or you could just give in to your stinking thinking and be depressed the rest of your life. You, my friend, make the choice. You want hard preaching? That's hard preaching. You've got to take responsibility from your own actions and stop blaming everybody else for your depression and everything else that's going on because you are the gatekeeper of that door into your mind. You're the gatekeeper. good friend of mine is built like a bodybuilder, man. And if I say his name, he's going to make me do extra (laughs) push-ups. But the other day, we went for a long ride on the motorcycles out in the country. I think there's going to be Harley Davidson's in heaven, you know, over the streets that are gold with no potholes. (laughs) And you know, Chuck, how freeing that is. Oh, man, just to get out there. Amen. Any bikers in the house today? Yeah, some of them were at a big CMA thing. But, you know, we were sitting there, and a guy come over, and he said to my good friend, I won't say his name, but because my arms are already starting to hurt just thinking about the extra workout I do, because you don't like to be noticed in public. But he literally said to him, this guy was about 90 years old, right? But he was an older guy, come walking over, and he said, can I ask you a question? And the guy's sitting there, Jack. He goes, how in the world do you get a body like that? How do you get those biceps, you know? You know how you get it? By working them out. Can I tell you what? Your mind can be worked out too. In the gymnasium of your mentality. And nobody can do it for you. It's up to you. And so I look at, you have to look at it like a built, jacked up bodyguard that's guarding the doors and the windows to your mind and your thought life. And you take that amygdala by the tail and you slam it to the ground. And you say, not today, devil. Not today, devil. So I want to declare something over you now before we close. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? You are not a hostage to your unhealthy thought life. The weapons that you fight with are not the weapons of this world. Man, there's so many scriptures there, folks. I got to... I got to... I have a hard time containing myself not to quote like a dozen scriptures at you like a gospel gun here. I'm just reminding you the power that you possess if you'll just tap into it, you know. You have divine power to demolish every stronghold, demolish every single pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. You have the power as a believer. Listen, worry is not your master. I'm declaring this over you now. Worry is not, some of you can't even sleep at night, for goodness sakes. Listen, and don't let the enemy distract you. If you've ever heard anything, listen now, because this affects greatly every day of the rest of your life. Man, my faith is just getting built as I'm sharing this with you. Worry is not your master. You trust in God. His peace guards your heart, guards your mind, guards your souls in Christ Jesus. You're not a slave to your habits. Boy, I'll tell you, if I had a nickel for every time somebody says, I just can't stop this habit. I just can't stop. Do you understand what you're doing to yourself? Instead of thinking and writing and confessing and believing, you're doing that, but you're doing the opposite thing. 
You're not a slave to your habits. I was an addict. I could talk like this because I was there. Trust me. And I understand the power of what I'm teaching you now today. You're not a prisoner to addiction. Don't let anybody ever tell you you're a prisoner to addiction. That's the thing I cannot stand about AA these days. Let me just, go, let me just say something real quick. Alcoholics Anonymous was founded by a born-again, spirit-filled believer named Bill Wilson. It was based on the Beatitudes. The greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher of all time, Jesus Christ. Read it in Matthew 5 when he said, blessed are they. Blessed. You know what blessed means? It means happy. You want to know who's happy? People that aren't bound. Satan doesn't have their clutches in them anymore. And he said that, blessed are they. And Bill Wilson took that and through prayer and he went on an extended fast. Many years ago, he came up with a program called Alcoholics Anonymous. But here's the problem. Just like when they took prayer and the Word of God out of the schools, they started changing. It started getting watered down over time. Now if you go to a recovery meeting, not the one we have here on Monday nights, not God's Mountain, but when you go to a typical Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in modern day America or NA, this is what the first thing they say when you go around the room, hi, my name is Bob, I'm an alcoholic. And he might not have had a drink for 30 years. Let me tell you something. I will never confess that I'm a drug addict because I'm not a drug addict. I was changed by the power of God at the cross of Calvary. So you need to start to think it, to write it, to confess it, and believe it. To think it, to write it, confess it, and believe it. Hallelujah. Get victory in your own life. Man, I'm all about laying hands on people. I've had hands laid on me by the best of them. But until you decide in your mind that you're going to change and you're not going to use your sickness as a crutch in you, I meet more people, ask them how they're doing, and they list 37 things that's wrong with them. What a great confession that is. (laughs) You know, in John 5, Jesus said to the invalid, 38 years laying, uh, uh, you know, he said, hey, do you even want to get well? good question. Do you even want to be freed up from addiction? Do you even want to have a healthy body? Or has your identity become your sickness? Has your identity become your addiction? You have the power, not in your own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Last point, be filled with the Holy Spirit. On Pentecost Sunday, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4 and verse 31. Worship team, come back. Praise God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I'm not interpreting God through circumstances. I'm interpreting my circumstances through the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Cover everything you do in prayer. Acts 4.31. And when they had what? When they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Pentecost. Are you kidding me? You realize Peter was the guy that denied Jesus? He was a coward. And just a few short days and one touch of the Holy Spirit's fire that fell, he became a bold evangelist that turned the world literally upside down on its ear for the cause of Christ. Ordinary, unschooled, uneducated fishermen. And if God could do it for Peter, he can do it for you. Stand to your feet. Let's give God some praise today. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. Cover everything you do in prayer. Hallelujah. Jude one twenty says that we should always be praying. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Spirit. It builds us up in the innermost faith. And our faith is built up when we pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen? Instead of talking about what's wrong, just go right into prayer in the Holy Ghost. Just go right into prayer. I'm learning. I haven't arrived, but I'm learning as time goes on. And the sands of time are running out, folks. When something's bothering me, not to just keep putting wood on the fire and magnifying my problem, but it's just to pray in the Holy Ghost and to take authority over the things that hell's trying to do to me. Amen? I love you so much. I want to help you. It's what we do here. We're helping each other in this thing, man. 
Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Pray. In the old timers used to call it pray through. That's what they called it. You come to an old fashioned altar and you'd pray and pray. And somebody many times would put a hand on their shoulder and they would pray until the release was given. And let me tell you, once the release is given, don't take it back out of that box. That's the difference. Don't pick it back up again. Some of us are carrying things this morning that God never intended us to carry. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Father, in your presence today, there's fullness of joy. There's peace. Peace that passeth all understanding, Lord. God, as we bow our heads today, God, we bow our hearts. We're calling upon you, Lord, to guard our minds. You said, let this mind be in you. We have the mind of Christ. Help us to utilize it, Lord. Not every day, Lord, but every hour, every minute, God, both when we're sleeping and not sleeping because we're not thinking, Lord, on the right things. Give us peace in our heart, Lord, that only you can give, Lord. We freely, God, receive this gift today. While we're praying and while we're looking to God, you're here this morning. And you've yet to surrender your life to Christ. You're yet to release control to the Lord. Heads bowed, eyes closed today. Please, no one looking around. I'm asking you this one question. I care about your souls, friend. And, and, and in addition to that, I will stand just like you by myself before the Lord one day and give an account for what has been preached from this sacred desk. And if today was my last sermon that I ever preached in my life, I would want to end it with an altar call. And I believe I'll live a long time, but only God knows for sure. Amen? So what about you? Heads bowed, eyes closed. You say, I'm here today. I need the Lord. I'm not living for God. My thought life has not been pure. I've allowed things into the corridors of my mind, and I could see where it's led me into anxiety and stress and fear and worry and sometimes panic attacks and heart palpitations and, and actually led me into sinful thoughts. And I don't want my, my life to be wasted. I want to make a difference for, for the kingdom of God and for people in my sphere of influence. I want to make a difference in my world and we can change our world together, but you've got to receive this gift that was already paid for. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. It's already been paid for on the cross, but you my dear friend, must come to a place in your life where you say, I'm done with the systems and the patterns of this world. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I want to receive God today. If that's you, I'm going to ask you on the count of three, just simply to put up your hand. This church, let me tell you something. This church loves you. We pray for you. I've wept many times over these altars when no one's around here, over these seats. Believe in God for your miracle people praying all week long for, for you that are here today. You watching out online out there. But I'm asking you this because I love you and I want to help you, friends. There's nothing worse than somebody drowning and, and you're in a lifeboat and, and you don't throw out a life preserver to them. How, I don't know how anybody could do such a thing. Can you imagine if we were in a boat and we were just decided to keep singing our songs and meanwhile people are drowning? You know, you see somebody's hands coming up out of the water saying, help, man. You rescue the perishing and you care for the dying. This, and you know this, this church has never been a museum for the saints. It's not a place to come in here and say, oh, you look nice, or you look nice, or what are you going to do? And they talk everything about God. That's okay to have some of that. It's called fellowship. But this is not a museum for the saints. It's a hospital for sinners. People with hurts, people with habitual thoughts, people with all kinds of hang-ups. This is a church for imperfect people. And so if you're here today and you mean business with God, I'm going to ask you on the count of three to put your hand up. One, two, three. Go ahead. Put your hand up. God bless you. God bless you. Yeah. God bless you. Keep it up for a second. God bless you. God bless you. God. I need God. I'm not too proud to ask for God's help, Pastor. I'm not too proud to ask God to help me, to purify my heart and my mind, my soul to be clean. I don't want to keep living day after day after day and feeling the way I do because I've been not thinking with the mind of Christ going to ask you now if you raise your hand as they sing this chorus to take a step for God and just come stand right here come on come on come on God bless you God bless you God bless you 
God bless you. Come on. God bless you. Come on. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, in the balcony, come on. Take a stand for God this morning. Take a stand for the Lord. Sing with us. Jesus is the answer for the world today. For the world today. Above him there's no other. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Those of you that are sitting out here in these seats or in the balcony, why don't you go ahead and turn to the person right next to you and ask them, say, do you need me to go forward with you? Listen, we're for you here. We're trying to help you. This church is not against you. We're for you. This pastor's for you. I know what it's like to struggle, man. Let us help you today. Let the Holy Spirit touch you. Leave here a free man, a free woman in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll sing it one more time. Come forward. Jesus is the answer oh, for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. He's the only way. Jesus is the answer. He's the only answer for the world today. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Help us to live for you, Lord. My good friend Pete Parchinski is here today. Bless you, Pete. It's good to see you. We go way, way back. Pete, God bless you, sis. Pete remembers where I was. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God, Pete. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God, Pete. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Pete. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And you know, people, people that know us, I, listen, no different than anybody else. Struggling, you know. Could have been in a recovery center. It would have, I, would have, I probably would have fit in a whole lot better. It's only the grace of God. I've buried some of my friends, you know. Literally, when I say, I mean, put their body in a six-foot hole. Let me tell you something. I don't care what you own, what you drive, or where you live. That's all well and fine. We all wind up, our, this, this fleshly <laughs> jar of clay, this shell, thank you, winds up in a six-foot hole in the ground. And the most important decision a person will ever, ever, ever make is whether or not they're going to walk these altars or whether they're going to give it over to God or whether they're going to keep living like the patterns of this world. And let me tell you something. It should be a no-brainer because this world is not getting any better. Have you noticed? And I don't know how much longer it's going to be. But I'll tell you this. God's going to call us out of this mess. And until He does... We're going to do everything we can to reach one more for Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Amen. Dear Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer out loud. Everybody pray this. Listen, if you're watching at home, pray this prayer. And say it out loud. Don't mumble it under your breath. Let your kids, sir, see that you humble your... Let me tell you, a real man is not full of pride. He's full of humility anyway. Pride repels God. Humility attracts his presence. When you're complaining, it pushes God away. When you just lift your hands and start to thank God, even when you don't feel like it, 
we got to stop going by our feelings and stop letting our feelings drive the cart of our life. And start thinking with the mind of Christ. Well, so humble yourself. You know, tears start coming down your face. Don't hide. Let, the, let your kids see. Let me tell you something. Your kids will never outlive that image that their dad was a father. Their mom was a person not perfect, but forgiven who humbled himself one day, maybe watching a preacher like this on broadcast. I'm amazed how many people tell us they watch this every single morning it's on. I'm like, I don't even watch it, you know. Amen? <laughs> uh, it's good, but I just, anyway. <laughs> it's a long story. I won't get into that. Let's pray, okay? Dear Jesus, today, today while I was listening to the Bible, I, to the Bible, I, realized, I realized I need you. I need you in my thought life, Lord. Need you in my heart. Need you in my home. I need you in my family. In my health. In every area of my life. I need you. Today, Lord, I confess with my mouth. And I believe in my heart. That God the Father raised his son. Jesus Christ from the grave and because he lives I too have eternal life I am saved help me to live for you empowered by the Holy Spirit and fire in Jesus name everybody said amen. come on give God a big hand of praise amen amen bless you Hey, folks, let me say one last thing to you before you go, okay? The altar worker is going to give you some things. Every day, now that I'm a believer, what's the first thing I need to do? Everybody put your hands together. Pray, all right? Talk to God. Prayer can do what God can do. Secondly, read the Word of God. That's where the renewing comes in, right? Let it wash your mind. Let it heal your mind through prayer and the Word. Lastly, everybody look this way for a minute. Come to church. Amen. Amen. Say, I will. will. Come to to. this church. church. Amen. 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 And if you're passing through, I get it. I mean, but go somewhere. Listen, seriously, go somewhere where they teach all of that book, not parts of it. They believe all of the gospel from Genesis to the maps. And you'll know it when you're there. You'll sense it in your heart. Amen. We love you. God bless you all. Hope to see you tonight at 630 up at Thrive Church Honesdale. Wow, what a powerful message. Now be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified for the latest video. And until next time, remember, we love you, God loves you, and may God's richest blessing be yours.